Hey, good morning. Um, we're ready to read chapter five. This chapter, we actually meet Emmett Till for the first time. And I also found uh, a PDF of this book so I can read it with you. Um, you can follow along that way. So let me see what I can do here. Pull that up. Here it is. Chapter 5. I was surprised by how little I remembered of Mississippi. I'd forgotten the heat, the heavy humidity that made me sweat all the time. The deep green bushes and trees everywhere seemed foreign. It was strange to look out the train window and not see mountains anywhere. When our train finally pulled into Greenwood, I started worrying. What had I done, I wondered, leaving Arizona for a place I hardly remembered. I collected my bags and stood on the platform of the Greenwood station. A few cars lined the red brick street in front of the station, and across the street I recognized one building at least, the Crystal Grill, one of Grandpa's favorite restaurants. I sat down on a bench to wait for Ruth Ann and to try to make some sense of this town my dad and I had grown up in. Most women on the sidewalks wore dresses and large hats. Many of the men wore baggy, short-sleeved white shirts and a few had on ties. It was early afternoon and the people seemed in a hurry to get somewhere, probably to find a place to escape the heat. I could hear snatches of conversation in the same heavy Mississippi accent that mom and dad sometimes lapsed into when they talked to each other at home and it seemed like the most natural kind of speech in the world. I couldn't figure out why Dad hated it here. It seemed like the homiest place on earth to me, and the longer I stood there, the happier I was to be away from my dad and back where I belonged. Another big difference between Greenwood and Tempe was the Negroes. There had been a few Negro porters on the train, but I was surprised by how many I saw around the Greenwood station. The freight workers on the platform were all Negroes, of course, but so were most of, almost half of the people around the station. The women wore simple cotton farm dresses without hats, and most of the Negro men and boys wore blue bib overalls, the same kind Grandpa always wore. Hiram! Hiram Hilburn, is that you? It was Ruth Ann, and I turned to greet her. She smiled, reached out, and held me by the shoulders. Child, you have grown. Arizona surely has been good to you. I was nearly six feet tall when I, when I was a boy. Ruth Ann used to tower over me, but now I was able to look her in the eye. You're just like Mr. Harlan. If you weren't so fresh looking, I'd swear you were Mr. Hilburn's own boy, not his grandchild. That was the last thing I wanted to hear. I'm nothing like my dad, Ruth Ann. Nothing at all. Shucks, you're your daddy's son, whether you like it or not, Mr. Hiram. But I guess at your age, you'd just soon not admit it. She pointed to my bags. Let's get those down to the trucks and get you home. Your grandpa can't wait to see you. When I tried to pick them up, she stopped me. You've been riding that train for three days. Let Bobo over here carry them. He's got nothing to do right now. She nodded to a Negro boy who looked about my age, standing near the edge of the platform. Bobo, she called, come on over here and carry Mr. Hiram's bags down to the truck. He gave her a bored look and didn't move. Get yourself over here this minute, she snapped, and don't you be giving me any of that sass. Bobo sauntered over. His clothes set him apart from the other Negroes I had seen around the station. Wearing black leather dress shoes, pants, and a white shirt, he looked nothing like a country boy from the Delta. He smirked at me as he stood next to Ruth Ann. Mr. Hiram, Ruth Ann said, this here is Bobo Till, my cousin's nephew. He just come down from money and he's been waiting on his train, or he just come down from Chicago and he's waiting on his train up to money. Hi, Bobo, I said. He only nodded in return, and Ruth Ann didn't like it. Don't you get on so rude, she said as she nudged him to the side with her arm. 
You talk when you've been talked to. Bobo rolled his eyes and then stuttered. Ha 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 hi, Hiram. That's better, said Ruth Ann. Now, you pick up Mr. Hiram's things and help me get them to the truck. And hurry up, or you'll be liable to miss your train. I've been on the train all the way from Chicago, Ruth Ann. I'm too tired to be carrying somebody else's old bags. It's okay, Ruth Ann, I said. I can handle my own things. I just got this duffel and the one suitcase. They're not heavy at all. See, Bobo said with a smirk, no need for me to be carrying his bags. Besides, it's too hot down here for me to be hauling stuff all over. Ruth Ann turned to him, turned him, turned on him with her hands on her hips. Emma Till, you'll do what you're told when you're told to do it. You've been raised better than that, and I know it. She glared at him until he went over and picked up my duffel bag. Satisfied that he had done it, at least part of what she had asked, Ruth Ann turned and headed down to the stairs off the platform and onto the street. Ain't been raised to be nobody's old porter, he muttered so Ruth Ann wouldn't hear. Then he looked at me and said, <clears throat> Don't nobody see and carry anybody carrying my, my bags for me, and followed Ruth Ann. I picked up my suitcase and walked along Bobo. <clears throat> so you're from Chicago, huh? You a Cubs fan? Nah, Bobo shrugged. It's dang hard to be a Cubs fan these days. What are they? 20-something games behind Brooklyn? Unless they've got a decent chance at the pennant, I've decided being a Cubs fan is a waste of time. Besides, I got better things to do at home than worry about baseball. Hey, do me a favor, he said as he paused at the top of the stairs. And hold this for a second. He handed me my duffel bag. I took it and he went down the stairs without me. I stood there feeling dumb as a brick. Bobo stayed a few steps ahead of me as we walked down the street to Grandpa's blue Ford pickup. Ruth Anna just dropped the tailgate when we arrived. And right before she turned around to see us, Bobo took my duffel bag from me and winked. Thanks, he said before he handed it to Ruth Ann to put in the bed of the truck. He turned and headed back to the train platform without saying goodbye. As we pulled away from the station, we drove past a blonde-haired girl about my age. She walked with her head down like she was trying to be invisible. Who's that girl? I asked Ruth Ann. Naomi Rydell. Ruth Ann shook her head and sighed. Too bad about that little girl. The things she's been through down here make a body wonder if God's in heaven. R.C.'s sister? I would have I would have never recognized her. Seeing Naomi, even for a moment, stirred a warm spot in my chest and made me remember that there was more than just Grandpa I cared about in Greenwood. But what things are you talking about? Same old, same old. Her no-count brother is in one scrape after another, and if that wasn't enough, her low-down father treats her worse than the family mule. Sleeps all day, drinks all night, never does a lick of work. Poor girl's running the house, trying to keep up that pitiful family together the best she can. Lord knows it can't be nothing but misery in the back of the, in that shack out there on River Road. Would Naomi remember me? I sure hoped she would. When I stepped through the front door of Grandpa's house, I closed my eyes and took a deep breath through my nose, and memories came flooding back. Grandma working in the kitchen, Grandpa sitting in his chair smoking a cigar and reading the paper, waking up mornings in my dad's old room with the smell of coffee and sausage. This was it. I was back. Ruth Ann had gone ahead for me in, into the living room. He's here, Mr. Hilburn, she said. Our boys come home. The rustle of newspapers and Grandpa's voice. Hiram, Hiram, son, come in here and let me get a look at you. When I entered the living room, Grandpa was in his favorite chair. On the side of it stood a wheelchair with a pair of wooden crutches lying across the armrest. Grandpa, Grandpa beamed when he saw me. Hey, Grandpa, 
Don't hate Grandpa me. Come here and give me a hug. I went to his chair and bent over to hug him. His cheeks were rough with stubble and paler than I remembered, but his arms felt as solid and strong as ever. Welcome back. Welcome back, son, he said softly as he held me. It's so good to have you back home again. When he let go, he wiped his eyes with the, with his finger and smiled. You've turned into a young young man, Hiram. Not much like that little boy who used to run around here and steal Grandma's ginger snaps. I didn't know what to say. It was hard not to stare at the wheelchair. Grandpa didn't seem right. Didn't seem like I remembered, or at least what I, like what I wanted him to be. Ah, don't worry about these old de doodads, he said, pointing to the wheelchair and the crutches. They are just temporary to help me until I got my blood circulating right, my legs working again. I'd be lying if I said it wasn't that stroke hadn't hit me hard at first, but now I'm getting around pretty good for an old man. A little slow and stiff sometimes, but I get around when I have to. Sit down, he waved his hand at me. You've had a long train ride and must be worn out. He raised up his chair, he raised up in his chair and called into the kitchen. Ruthann, this boy needs some cold lemonade and see if you can round up a plate of some of those cookies I've been smelling for these past two days. In a moment, Ruthann returned and set a glass of lemonade and a plate of ginger snaps on the table beside me and handed Grandpa a tall glass of iced tea. He took a drink and squinted at it, squinted as it, as if he were in pain. Damn it all, Ruthann, this tastes like brown water. Can't I get something to sweeten it up? Now, Mr. Hilburn, Ruth Ann shook her head, you know what Dr. Patterson said about you and sugar. I'm just doing what he asked me to do. Damn diabetes, Grandpa muttered as he handed her the glass, handed the glass back to her. I'm not thirsty anyway. Guess I'll just enjoy getting reacquainted with my oldest grandson for a while. As soon as Ruth Ann left the room, Grandpa said, Hiram, hand me a couple of those ginger snaps, will you? What Ruth Ann and Dr. Peterson don't know won't hurt them any. Grandpa nibbled on the cookies while I told him about Joseph, Emma, Eliza, and Brigham. He was full of questions about them and often pulled out an envelope that held snapshots Mom had sent him over the years to get a good look at, to look at while I talked about my brothers and sisters. We've got to get them to come out here for a visit sometime, he said. I need to see the rest of my grandchildren, and they need to see me and Grandma's house. We talked for a couple more hours, but Grandpa never once asked about Dad, and I didn't offer to talk about him. Being around Grandpa again made me feel good and reminded me why I hated Dad for making us move to Arizona. I didn't care what Ruth Ann or anybody said. I wasn't like my father. I was my Grandpa's boy, always had been always would be. The next morning, I, it felt kind of strange when I woke up in my old bed in dad's room and smelled the familiar breakfast aroma coming across, coming up from the kitchen. For a moment, I felt like I was a little kid again and grandma was down in the kitchen cooking breakfast. The moment soon passed, but I lay in bed for a long time, savoring the warm feelings and the memories that washed over me in my favorite place in the world. Ruthann finally called me down to breakfast. It was good to be back in Greenwood. I had come home. I had come back home and I was free. So here's this image again. <clears throat> There's the blue Ford pickup truck or a, cop, a picture of a blue Ford pickup truck found it interesting that dad and grandpa never grant that grandpa never asked about um Hiram's dad when he got there and um i also thought that this was interesting this little exchange here with uh Emmett and um Ruth Ann and Hiram when Hiram first meets Emmett um so anyway, I just wanted to highlight that something for you to think about. Um, it seems interesting that 
Emmett's face is here on the cover and it's very large and we really haven't heard anything about Emmett Till in this book until chapter five, which is where we are right now. Anyhow, that's the reading for today.